Welcome back to Restored Gospel Podcast, and I'm here with Corey Stark, continuing to give him time to teach and expound on things that he studied. Corey, it's all yours. Thank you, brother. I appreciate you having me back on. Today's class is going to be picking up from where we left off at Living Hope a few weeks back. This is material we never covered. Um, I hope I don't get too excited or kind of go too fast. I know I can do that. So the first part's going to start off with Isaiah and the Book of Mormon. And this is, um, it's not trickery. I'm just going to simply show you some things I've found. And this really has been my own work. I haven't leaned on anyone else. Um, but, well, it'll just speak for itself. So Isaiah lived, I don't know, about 750 BC. He he died maybe 80 or so years before Lehi and Nephi were writing. Um, but his works at that time were in the plates of brass. So we get this information in the Book of Mormon from the plates of brass. Now, this is a point I'll bring up again later in other contexts. But what's important is that we get a snapshot of what scripture they had 600 years before Christ. Um, this helps resolve a few disputes, in fact, by theologians, if we want to believe that the Book of Mormon is a credible witness to these things. But um, So the, the Book of Mormon, it beautifully blends Isaiah. There's well over 100 and probably closer to 200 references to Isaiah. And by reference, I mean just a single verse here and there. Um, not entire chapters. We have entire chapters as well. But uh, sometimes uh, what we read in the Book of Mormon is actually a, a little bit different than what we get in either the King James or the Inspired Version. Now, it's interesting because critics of the Book of Mormon will often line in their bullet points of criticisms, oh, Joseph Smith just plagiarized from Isaiah. Well, I've heard that. And I wanted to understand that if it was true or not. So in my process of study, I, for myself, I believe I answered that question. But it's the other things I learned along the way that were kind of surprising to me. Um, so I'm going to state up front that Isaiah, as it's contained in the Book of Mormon, is not plagiarized. There's, there's nothing close to it. And I think some of these scriptures will bear that out. So I started comparing the Book of Mormon verses in the King James, but then about halfway through that pursuit, I thought, well, this would be interesting to add the inspired version in here too. So I did that and I've got a spreadsheet. I'm not going to actually show you the spreadsheet, but it has tabs that compare all three books together verse by verse in as much as I could root out the, the inspired version. I'm sorry, the, the, the Isaiah passages from the Book of Mormon. It's easy to find them right in the Bible, uh, King James or inspired version but sometimes they're blended in, in the inspired version. And that in and, in and of itself answers a question I have, which when I was younger, I was sometimes a little frustrated because I'd be reading in the Book of Mormon and then I'd want to know, well, where does this correlate to in Isaiah? Because I, I knew it was Isaiah, but I didn't know where. And that in and of itself is tiny, but it's a testimony of the validity of the Book of Mormon. The reason is Isaiah's writings, Psalms, Proverbs, none of those writings were divided by chapter and verse. They were simply referenced to by the line they began with. And in the in the days anyhow of you know of Lehi and Nephi, there weren't chapter and verse markings. So this is important because in the Book of Mormon, there's not a single reference to like say Isaiah 29 verse 3 or something like that. It never does that. Now, I, I can tell you, if, if I was thinking I was going to source Isaiah, I'd have all the chapter and verse notes all over, which I do in the PowerPoint. But it's never done in the Book of Mormon. But again, it wasn't done in that day. So it's a little point to the authenticity, but there's more. So um, like I said, there's many references. I'm going to show you, just starting off with one, this is kind of a high welcome to Isaiah in the Book of Mormon. This is Isaiah 51, 1, and... It's a common verse, but what's interesting about it is how it's used in the Book of Mormon. The inspired, uh, I'm sorry, this is just the King James, uh, but it, it includes a line here that's not stated in the Book of Mormon. This first part that says, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. He that hath no money, come ye buy and eat. That part isn't contained in the uh, Book of Mormon, but 
it picks up with this line, which says, buy milk and honey without money and without price. Well, in that, there's a difference because the Bible reference says, buy wine and milk without money and without price. But the Book of Mormon says, buy milk and honey without money and without price. Well, that in and of itself is a difference. But what's beautiful is how this is used. I'm quoting here from this RLDS reference, 2 Nephi 11, which is 2 Nephi 26, if you're following in the LDS. But what's interesting, and this is just something I kind of found looking it up in the Book of Mormon, when you read this in the context of the Book of Mormon, we get Nephi's words surrounding it to where the center of this is a, a chiasm built around Isaiah's words. And to, to read it all, it doesn't jump out at you, but when you lay it out, you start seeing these beautiful elements of chiasm, uh, different types of parallelism, synonymous, where these ideas are the same. Um, you get antithetical parallelism, rhetorical questions, but uh, the elements, you know, of this, he's like the C prompt, the, the center is Isaiah's words, but where you get him talking about departing from you, well, that's surrounding it. You know, he's not commanded anyone to depart or shall they not partake in B? And then it asks the question, hath any commanded that he should not partake? Um, so here you get a statement and then you get a rhetorical question and, and you get these back and forth. He does not anything save it be for the benefit of the world that he could draw all men unto him. And that's how it ends, but with a rhetorical question, hath the Lord commanded any that they should not partake? No, but all men are privileged all to come to him. So anyhow, just as an example, this is, I think, just a beautiful element that <laughs> I don't know how you take Isaiah and make it better, but if they did it and they they weren't plagiarized. And I mean, none of this stuff could be plagiarized, but to build a beautiful chiasm that is not only beautiful to read, but has content and is is correct i i just think it's amazing um so anyhow the the parallelisms the chiasms the things that nephi and jacob do they were as blessed let's say as as uh, isaiah was in his writing so that's just sort of an intro but um we we get other little ones like this is just a single verse isaiah 54 5 if you read it in the king james for thy maker is thine husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth shall he be called. What the Book of Mormon has is the same verse, but it simply omits one word. This word is. But when you read it, and, and it says, for thy maker, thy husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, all of a sudden what you realize is this is another beautiful parallel. You get thy maker, thy husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, a redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of whole, the whole earth shall he be called. Um, it's a parallelism on multiple levels, but it's it's more accurate to the Hebrew. Uh, here, the translators likely inserted this word is because they felt like that's what it had to, to be to make sense in English. Okay, I, I get that. But they missed the larger point that all this verse was a beautiful parallel. And Thy maker, thy husband, the Lord of hosts is his name. Thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth shall he be called. That all fits in, in noun and verb and subject. Um, and it's lost if you simply have that word is. What a difference the word is makes, right? I guess it maybe depends on what your definition of is is, right? But uh, this, is, this is just another element. It's tiny, but it makes me realize this in, a, in and of itself couldn't have been plagiarized. I mean, if you plagiarized, it would have copied it word for word. But to remove one specific word and then have a beautiful parallel emerge, to me, is just, I don't know, it's its not kindergarten stuff. So the Book of Mormon restores, I believe, proper parallelism. And Isaiah was a master of parallelism. So here's where we see the divinity of the translation, where, again, the content is more accurate. Now, I'll make a statement about this in that it's true of all scripture in that there can be errors because the the work itself was copied by hand by people scribes who dedicated their lives to write accurately as as accurately as possible but there were no photocopiers and there were no digital recorders 
So if you had a copy of scripture, it had to be done by hand. Were there likely omissions and changes? Yeah. Could it have happened even in the time between Isaiah to Nephi? Perhaps so. And so I guess, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't know how to say it any, any other way other than what part of Isaiah that we have is accurate was also translated more accurately in the Book of Mormon than we have anywhere else. And, and I think that becomes evident. So going on, um, jump in here, Mike, if you want to comment too. Okay. But so where I think it's also interesting is how the Book of Mormon restores parallelisms in this way. Um, in, in this passage from the King James Isaiah chapter 2, starting at verse 12, 13, 14, the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and the lofty, everyone that is lifted up, upon all the cedars of Lebanon, they that are, that are high and lifted up, upon all the oaks of Bashan, upon all the high mountains in the hills that are lifted up. But what we get in the Book of Mormon is this beautiful chiasm, and it adds an element. It adds the nations. And when you have the nations added in here, you get this true meaning now, which states, and this is how it reads in the Book of Mormon, for the day of the Lord of hosts soon cometh upon all nations, yea, upon everyone, upon the proud and lofty, and upon everyone which is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. See, that, that context here in red is all omitted in the King James. And then what you find out is there's a chiasm built around this of the day of the Lord coming upon all the cedars of Lebanon, for they are high and lifted up. Now, God's speaking about people here. It's not about trees in the forest. But the point is that it's contained in these words that are present in the Book of Mormon, but absent in the King James. Uh, so it works its way into this. Everyone is high and lifted up and upon all the oaks of Bashan, and upon all the high mountains, and upon all the hills, and upon all the nations which are lifted up. See that the Book of Mormon, by adding this element about the nations, restores a chiasm, and it restores perfect parallelism, none of which exists when the text is read out of the King James. Hey, Corey. Yeah. Uh, or Corey, just a reminder. So the, these, these uh, verses here are important, but also, it's important to see that as the as these are the chiasms are here, that the Book of Mormon is what it says it is. So even if these verses here, you know, you look at and say, well, what does that mean? I don't I don't know what the cedars and the Bashan and all that means anyway. So what's the big deal? The, and, and the important thing is the Book of Mormon is what it says it is. This is a perfect uh, example of Hebrew writing and poetry. And and um, and the Bible has gone through, you know, many hands and. So if it's what it says it is, even in these little tiny things, then all of the other major doctrinal things about salvation and atonement and coming to Christ, all can be relied on. So it's just, I think it's important to know that this proves in so many ways that this wasn't the work of a man, but it was a divine work and that we can use it to, as a foundational truth about Jesus. 100% agree. Amen to that. So one of the things that I like, too, is in little ways, um, the Book of Mormon does something that is not unique to the Book of Mormon. But for instance, uh, it restores things like plural amplification. Now, what is that? It's when you take a word that's singular and you pluralize it. And the, the purpose for the plural is to maybe augment the immensity of the meaning of the word. Uh, in this case, we have an example from the Book of Mormon. It's it's all the same, Isaiah and the Book of Mormon, from Isaiah 53, verse 6, to the RLDS Mosiah 8.21. But it changes one word, and it says, The Lord hath laid upon him the iniquities of us all. If you read it in the King James, it just says, The Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. This, in the King James, is singular, plural in the Book of Mormon. Well, it's an example of plural amplification. It's a Hebrew type of method, like I said, what it does. But the interesting thing is where it's used. I mean, you could go through and pluralize a lot of words if you knew what they were, just to make them sound bigger or different. But it's done in very few instances, but it's done here. And this is something that the Book of Mormon teaches, 
that the cost of our sin was not finite, but rather infinite. And to take this word, the iniquity of us all, and to make it iniquities implies the infinite nature of our transgression. And, and again, it's, it's just done here, but it's done beautifully to where the, the meaning and the content and the context are, are appropriate. Uh, it's not overdone, it's not over, underdone, but it's appropriately done. And this is, again, just an example of it. One word difference, but it's, it's got a huge meaning difference. Uh, here's another one. <clears throat> Same thing, Isaiah 53, 8. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. You know, we, we know this popular chapter about he being in prison and who shall declare his generation. The only difference in that passage is this one word. It's the transgressions for the transgressions of my people was he stricken in the Book of Mormon versus the transgression of my people was he stricken. Transgression, you know, I've talked about the transgression of the people. That is already in our English thinking pluralized, right? But to add the S on the end makes its meaning beyond something that the word transgression can even capture. And that's, again, the point of why they did it. But it's done in the Book of Mormon, one word, one letter difference, but it's got a completely uh, more expanded meaning because of that. So little idea of plural amplification. So there's another interesting passage, and uh, I'll just jump to it, and then we'll explain this here in a second. So the Book of Mormon restores some lost phrases out of verses. Uh, the King James, Isaiah 2.16, says, Upon all the ships of Tarshish and upon all pleasant pictures. Well, that phrase, if you read it in the Book of Mormon, says, Upon all the ships of the sea and upon all the ships of Tarshish, and upon the pleasant pictures. So the word all and the are different. But here's the point. The Book of Mormon adds this phrase, upon all the ships of the sea. Now, someone could think, well, Joseph Smith just inserted that, you know, because it doesn't appear in the King James, right? That's pretty daring to just insert things that don't exist. But look at this. Now, well, this isn't the point. The inspired version matches the, the Book of Mormon here. But the, the real point is this. If you go back to the Greek version of the Old Testament, which was compiled around 200 or so BC, it's, you know, scholars don't count the Book of Mormon, which is an older record yet, but they count this Septuagint, even though it was Greek. The Greek translation back into the Hebrew, when you compare it, states it this way. Now, I've got that same verse, but the first line is missing upon the ships of the sea. The King James omits the first line, but it has a second line about the ships of Tarshish, and it has the third line about the pleasant pictures. Notice this, though. The Septuagint, this other manuscript, it states, just like this, upon every ship of the sea, okay, the ships of the sea, but it omits the second line, the line about the ships of Tarshish, and then it has uh, a, a concluding statement. But the point is this. The Book of Mormon fills in the blanks that both are missing. I mean, one of them's missing the first line, the other one's missing the second line, but the Book of Mormon captures all three. Now, how do you, how you just come up with that and be historically accurate against manuscripts, you know, that were lost and then kind of drawn back together? I don't know. I, I think that's kind of a bullseye for the Book of Mormon, though. Who would have, who would have been able to study so meticulously to just bring this together like this out of two separate manuscripts and have have it appear in the Book of Mormon the way it does. I, I don't think it's possible. So that's kind of a big deal to me. Um, scholars, LDS scholars and other people have written about this. I don't know if it's gained a lot of fame around the world, but it's just one of these things where it makes you scratch your head and have to say, well, there's something here to it. So this next one, I want to show you just a little bit longer passage. It's 2 Nephi 11, and if you're in the LDS, it's 2 Nephi 26. But what we get is this idea of the Gentiles dwindling in unbelief. And these blue verses here, I just wanted to show you where they're at. They're interspersed in Nephi's writings. And Nephi makes some statements, and then he writes a little bit of Isaiah. And then he makes another statement, and he writes about Isaiah. But it's all about the Gentiles, us, dwindling in unbelief. 
and how the Lord would camp around the people of this land. The, the Lord would do that, and he would bring his punishment to them by the hand of the Gentiles. Well, this is another example, once again, when you lay it out, that there's a chiasm. And if you look here, these are the references in the RLDS version of this, like Nephi 78 through 90. That's these verses here that I just showed you. But when you when you start laying out each little verse as a chunk, you realize there's a beautiful chiasm. And it first starts out saying, it must needs be that the Gentiles be convinced that Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God. But it concludes about the Gentiles that they're lifted in the pride of their hearts. And then it says that the brethren or the remnant were dwindling in unbelief. And then it states those who dwindled would be smitten by the Gentiles. And then it introduces saying the Lord camps around them and and what he would do would happen quickly. And then it begins the conclusion stating that it would be an instant sudden destruction upon all those who dwindled. And we see this historically, but here's, here's the beautiful part is the inner part that the words of the ancients would speak from the dust and their words would be sealed up in a book. But if you look through here, we have Nephi's words, Nephi's words, Nephi's words, and then Isaiah's words, Isaiah's words, building out this beautiful reflective chiasm, which I don't know what you would have to study, you know, if you were an American growing up in rural New York to, to be able to build this kind of stuff out. But it, it exists. It's here. Um, but I just don't think the Book of Mormon has been given credit for it. None of this could be the work of simply plagiarizing Isaiah, not to build these beautiful parallelisms around it. So again, Isaiah kind of skillfully is interwoven in Nephi's words. There are a lot of verses in the Book of Mormon where it differs. And I won't show you the spreadsheet right now, but just like these different highlighted words. I know you really can't read this, but um, when, when there's highlighted phrases or bold words, they're different. And it just, it happens. We compare verses side by side and you get these noticeable differences in some cases. So um, any yeah, hundreds of examples like this, I want to give you a couple different ones. Now I want to show the inspired version with the King James with the book of Mormon. And so this is interesting to me. You, you get this, uh, the inspired version, and I, I can't answer these questions. And this is where the road becomes a little more bumpy now. I don't know why when there's a statement uh, quoting Isaiah in the Book of Mormon that the inspired version being, you know, by inspiration or a message to us wouldn't always follow the Book of Mormon. Why wouldn't it, why would it not? If the, if the Book of Mormon had something different, why wouldn't you follow that? Why would you instead choose to follow the King James? If, if the Book of Mormon differs from the King James, for instance. So, here's the point is that in many situations, and this is just an example, the book of Mormon was different. The book of Mormon omitted this verse that says that divided the sea, but it's, but the inspired version follows the King James. So the King James has something the inspired version follows word by word, but it's not in the book of Mormon. Why is that? I don't know, but here's a couple more that kind of get in a little deeper to this. So, Isaiah 48, 1 in the inspired version makes this statement, Hear ye this, O house of Jacob, which are called by the name of Israel, and are come forth out of the waters of Judah, which swear by the name of the Lord, and make mention of the God in, of Israel, but not in truth nor in righteousness. The King James follows that exactly. I, let me reverse that. The inspired version follows the King James. The King James came first. It's the same word by word. But what's different is the Book of Mormon, where it begins with this phrase that you shared with me once, Mike, on a podcast before. Remember hearken in here? You know, mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Right. Maybe you want to comment on that. But notice that Isaiah in the King James did just said, hear this, and then inspired version followed suit. Yeah, I think it follows along the lines a little bit of those that have ears to hear, let them hear. It, it means more. It's a double emphasis and it means come and, and do or come and, and hear. Um, it's just a little more emphasis as well. Yeah, and it's it's a more accurate translation. And again, you know, Englishmen who had some knowledge of Hebrew 
uh, made the King James translation. Today, 400 plus years later, the scholars understand Hebrew better and they can do even better translations. But if you're given the commission by God to translate this record and you can't read any of it, but God gives you a translation, that translation is, is closer to the original, which hearken in here is better. It is closer to the original. So here we get this hearken and hear this, O house of Jacob, which are called by the name of Israel and are come forth out of the waters of Judah, which swear by the name of the Lord and make mention of the God of Israel. Now here's where it differs. Yet they swear not in truth nor in righteousness. And, and we don't have that in the other texts. So my question is, why would the inspired version not follow the Book of Mormon in this situation? I, I don't know. I don't know why that is. There's many examples like this, uh, and it's just one of them. But, you know, is it, and I, I got to give them credit. No one had Excel back then. I mean, I laid all these out in an Excel spreadsheet and, and tried to, uh, and maybe when we're done, I, I can show you what it looks like. But it's easier to compare. In fact, I even programmed the spreadsheet to go through and match the verses omitting punctuation just to try to compare words by words. And that helped me find some of these differences too. Um, but there's many, many. And again, there's no plagiarism involved. In all situations, when you read the text in the Book of Mormon, it's plainer, it makes better sense, but the language all stays in context of Hebrew, which to me is just amazing. Um, so, well, I think it would be also important too when the covenant people that are supposed to um, come to a knowledge of the covenants, you know, the house of Lehi and, and Joseph, well, that some of this Hebrew language is important to be there so that it's familiar to them or, or you know, that they recognize that as part of good, that culture. Good point. Good point. Exactly. Here's one that's a head scratcher for me. And What's, what's more is that it's not just an omission of a phrase like this. They omitted this, yet they swear not in truth or in righteousness. But but here, <clears throat> I'm sad to say, and this it kind of irritates me that this wasn't something more obvious to all of us a couple generations ago. Maybe other people have seen it, but this is one I found in researching this. The inspired version not only has a different phrase, it has an opposite meaning. And this is from Isaiah 51, 19. It talks about how Israel's been beat up literally through the ages. And then it makes a statement. It says, these two sons are come unto thee. And the inspired version says, they shall be sorry for thee, thy desolation, destruction, thy famine, thy sword. And I know I've read that out of Isaiah 51 in the inspired version. The, the King James, and sorry, it's not parallel across the screen. screen it's down here. It uses the word things. It says, these two things are come upon thee. Who shall be sorry for the desolation and destruction, famine and the sword? By whom shall I comfort thee? It represents the antithesis of this in that the, the inspired version is making this statement as if to say, there's two sons who are going to come along and they're going to have pity on you, Israel, where the King James is kind of like, these two things, it doesn't call them sons, are coming upon thee. Who's going to be sorry for thee? And what are the things? The desolation, destruction, the famine, and the sword. Those, those are represented by these sons. Well, what the Book of Mormon says is something totally different. It's better than the King James, but it's opposite of the inspired version. And this is what bothers me, and I don't have an answer for this, unless someone was just writing what they thought it meant. Uh, but what... What we get is, I'll, I'll start a couple of verses before in Second Nephi 5. Awake, stand up, O Jerusalem, thou hast drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. Thou hast drunken the dregs of the cup of trembling wrung out, and none to guide her among all the sons she hath brought forth, neither that taketh her by the hand of all the sons she has brought up. So here we have a little context. It's saying, hey, your children have all abandoned you. And then it's as if it's saying, and the, there's two more children coming, though, but they're not here for any good either. And these two sons are coming to thee. Who shall be sorry for thee? I, I think it's a rhetorical question stating that uh, no one is going to be sorry for you and not these two sons. Thy desolation and thy destruction, thy famine and the sword. 
I, I think somehow maybe this was read in the Book of Mormon to imply the two sons would be sorry for them. But no, I think it's saying, hey, these two sons are coming and who's going to be sorry for you? No one, not them either, because of the, the way the rest of it reads. The Book of Mormon takes this and it produces like a negative from this. But the inspired version flips it around and it tries to treat it as a positive, like these two sons are coming to rescue you. I, I don't think that's what was meant by this. And so when we, and what's more is when you see this, these sons are coming to thee, they shall be sorry for thee. Scholars translate this in the King James as calamities. These two sons are these two things, but not as helpers. The Book of Mormon implies these sons are not helpers. But what's interesting is that when you take up the next verse, and it's verse 106 in the Book of Mormon, the inspired version follows right along again. It says, thy sons have fainted, save these two. And this phrase is not in the King James. So if you're following what I'm saying, it's like the, the inspired version follows the Book of Mormon to a point, and then it flips it around and makes a statement that's not found in the Book of Mormon, at least the way I read it. And then it resumes with a phrase that the Book of Mormon has that's not in the King James. So it's like someone was following it. Either they didn't follow everything or they thought they had a different spin on it. But I just, I just can't answer this. And I don't know how you, how you get this meaning that's been derived in the inspired version from it, that they'll be sorry for the, the, the two sons were the desolation, destruction, famine, and sword. That was what was represented by them. I, again, it's just like, it just seems like it's a little bit of the JV team trying to take over for the varsity squad here or something. I, I just don't get it. I don't know. Any, any comment on that, Mike? No, not really. Yeah. Well, it's, it's one that it's a head scratcher. So for me, anyhow, um, another one, and I just see some instant inconsistencies. The inspired version in the King James match in the 48th chapter they shall call themselves to the holy city and stay themselves on the God of Israel. The Lord of hosts is his name. This reads the same in both texts. When you read it in the Book of Mormon, you get this a, a difference. They swear not in truth or righteousness. And, and we shared a little bit of this before. But, but now this statement is, nevertheless, they call themselves of the holy city, but they do not stay themselves upon the God of Israel, which is the Lord of hosts. See, this phrase is inserted here, and it's not in the inspired version. And and and, and it's an antithesis because... Yeah, exactly, opposite. Yeah, exactly. And so the Book of Mormon has something that's opposite that's not caught in the inspired version, and the inspired version just follows suit of the King James. Why, why if the point was to fix all these things, why wasn't that fixed then? I mean, because it's clearly opposite. I, I don't know. It's... Like I said, to me, it's a head scratcher, but it starts, it's, I don't know. I, when you see these things start to line up, you start realizing, you know, maybe it wasn't Joseph Smith who did some of these changes. It could have been the two committees that came after him. Uh, you know, when the book was first published in the later 1800s, and then again in the 1900s, it passed through the hands of two groups in the RLDS church. I don't know what their intent was, but it was either carelessness Maybe I would I would say it was that, or maybe they just felt like it didn't matter. Maybe someone really didn't go through and, and examine all these texts. But when you start to look at them, you realize, one, all this stuff gets Joseph Smith off the hook for, there was no plagiarizing, I can guarantee that. But why the inspired version doesn't follow these texts, it's without answer. At least I don't have an answer. So, um so then we come to Isaiah 29. And so this is an interesting one where, for, for multiple reasons, um, it, the, this phrase from Isaiah in the inspired version is different from the King James. It just simply says that I, the Lord, will camp against her roundabout. The King James says, and I will camp against thee roundabout. But the Book of Mormon says something completely different. It says, yea, after that, the Lord God shall have camped against them round about. It's got different phrasing altogether. Well, what's interesting about that little phrase after that, it's not unique to the Book of Mormon, but the Book of Mormon verifies this. There's a Hebrew word. I've got it right here. 
that typically will translate to, in English, after that, the, the Hebrew has, uh, like, you know, every language has nouns and verbs and different types of verbs. Well, they have causative verbs, which uh, ascribe cause, like who did something or when they did something. And it's just a different expression that we don't have in English. But we sometimes struggle to have the right words to express that in English if it came from Hebrew. Well, in the in the Book of Mormon, I counted, well, actually in the King James, there's 64 times in the Old and New Testament combined where this phrase, uh, 64 verses rather, where this phrase after that appears. There's 121 in the Book of Mormon where you get this after that. So this is just a tiny little nugget, but it points back to if you translated it correctly, how should it be corrected, or correctly stated? And the word is to say after that. But the inspired version, the King James, they all do their own thing. Uh, the Book of Mormon does something that seems to be more authentic and more complete. So I want to get a little bit deeper into Isaiah 29. And, and so what we find is there's, again, some unique language to the inspired version in verse 4. It simply says, and she shall be brought down. The King James says, and thou shall be brought down. But the Book of Mormon is different yet. After that, they shall have been brought down low in the dust. So again, we have another one of these after that's. Even that they are not, yet the words of the righteous shall be written, and the prayers of the faithful shall be heard, and all they which have dwindled in unbelief shall not be forgotten. For they which shall be destroyed shall speak unto them out of the ground, and their speech shall be low out of the dust. Your voice shall be one that hath a familiar spirit. When we compare this, now I, I would be willing to argue that maybe these words in red were Nephi's words, but the words in black were, at least the, the first ones, were part of Isaiah's writings. It, it matches. But what's interesting is this part down here. The inspired version and the King James both follow each other. And it states, moreover, the multitude of her strangers shall be like small dust, shall be like small dust. But the first part started, it says, her speech shall be low out of the dust. If you read this in the Book of Mormon, again, it's it's part of a, this chiasm. But what you find is that it doesn't say shall be like small dust. I really think this was a translation error and the inspired version just followed it. But what their reference was, was speech shall be low out of the dust. I'm sure the word low and small are probably similar, although I don't know what the actual Hebrew was, but it could have been quickly looked at by translators of the King James. Oh, it's low or, or small like dust. But the point was, it was low and out of the dust. That's, that's how the intro starts, and that's how this chiastic part reflects it. So, mistranslations exist. They're fixed in the Book of Mormon here. We had small like the dust versus low out of the dust. I, I just, I don't know, I see these things and I'm shaking my head thinking, we've, we've placed, I think, too much trust in assuming that everything in the inspired version was somehow uh, translated correctly, I guess to use that word translated. And is, that, is that Book of Mormon phrase there? So uh, verse 83, uh, they shall have been brought down low in the dust, even they that are not. And then 84 at the end, it says their speech shall be low out of the dust. Uh, and then the words righteous shall be written. I wondered if that was a chiasm in nature, if you follow that through. It is. It is. Yeah. I don't think I, I don't have this chiasm kind of laid out that way, but it, you're right. It is. And And what happens is Nephi's words make it the chiasm. You don't get the chiasm if you're looking at it out of the uh, out of either text from the Bibles. Yeah, it talks about speaking unto them out of the ground. And if you go at the top, the prayers of the faithful shall be heard. So those are the same thought process. Uh, I just it looks uh, well, it looks more Hebrew on the right to me in the Book of Mormon, and it follows that pattern. Exactly, exactly. And who? Who even knew of these patterns back then? No one. No one was writing about Hebrew parallelisms in that day. There wasn't a textbook you could turn to in anywhere in the world other than, I've mentioned before, a guy in the 1700s named Loth, L-O-W-T-H, 
<clears throat> wrote a book, wasn't translated into English until I think the early 1900s. And he identified like three simple types of Hebrew parallelisms. But it wasn't something that could have gone into this depth. Joseph Smith didn't have it. So um, again, I asked this question, why, why didn't the inspired version follow this here? I, I don't know. I just, again, maybe they were, they were quick in their translation. Uh, if you go to Restored Gospel, you can click on this section that says the inspired version, King James comparison, and it'll bring up an opportunity for you to compare most of the changes between the King James and the inspired version. Now, if you look in Isaiah 29, you're going to see it, it lays out like this. And I know it's hard to read, but the point is you get large blocks in Isaiah 29 that don't exist in the King James Version. The previous ones we looked at, yeah, the, the verses line up and there's a word or phrase difference. But then all of a sudden you get lots and lots of verses in the inspired version that are unanswered in the King James. And I used to read this and think, well, this is the inspiration that that Joseph had to write this in. But then what I realize is it, it came from Nephi's writings. And I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna summarize all this other than I'm not gonna go into the details of this rather than to just summarize it and simply say Nephi's words were plain and simple. Isaiah's words were effective, but they they always followed a pattern of his parallelisms. You don't get that in these words. And and so these ones that don't have an answer. What this is an example of is Nephi's writings. They were unfortunately inserted in the inspired version, I believe out of a zealousness, either on the part of Joseph Smith or RLDS committees to promote that a sealed book would come forth because I, Isaiah only had a sentence or two about it. Here's the problem with it all. It implies that Isaiah wrote these words if you put it in a book and call it, this is the Bible now, and here's words you didn't have from Isaiah. I honestly believe these were Nephi's words. They weren't Isaiah's words. And if you go through the comparison, which it would take a whole podcast just to do that, it becomes evident that Joseph's intent wasn't, wasn't well understood here. It would have better been left to not include all these verses. It, in fact, I'll go a step further. It would have been better not to even call this an in, a translation, like Joseph Smith's new translations. That's what they were calling it. Maybe call it a commentary, you know, a Bible commentary. But to call all these things where you have all these verses here that are that are different, how can these be a translation when they're when they're not the same as this text that we just got out of the ground called the Book of Mormon? How can that be a translation if there's a difference? I mean, I think the Book of Mormon provided the clearest translation of Isaiah possible. In the places where the inspired version differs from Isaiah, it's certainly not better. In fact, it seems to be wrong. I hate to use a strong word, but it, it seems to be incorrect. It seems to wander. So anyhow, you can look at it yourself if someone's interested in taking this any farther, but, but I just feel like all of Isaiah's Writings should have been left intact. If you want to call it a commentary, that would have been better, but not a translation. It, it wasn't translating Isaiah's words. It was Nephi's words. Comments or thoughts? Nope. All right. So kind of my thoughts. So one of my conclusions on this is that Joseph Smith didn't plagiarize Isaiah. There's too many differences. And, and the differences in the Book of Mormon are, are better. Critics will sling dirt saying, oh, he, he just plagiarized it. They, they hope that it discourages you, but they haven't read the text. I can guarantee you they haven't, because if they had, they would have been quiet about this, hoping that we didn't notice the differences. Well, now the differences are coming to light. They don't hurt my faith in this, because I'm realizing now, and for some reason I'm going to share here in a minute, that the, the, the inspired version we got was influenced by different people, different, different writings, um, that'll bear itself out here in a minute. But my faith wasn't in that. My faith was in what Joseph Smith was given. <clears throat> According to the Book of Commandments, his only task was to translate the Book of Mormon. That was his only gift, rather. And so in that, I think he performed that flawlessly. I think he was put up to other things by people around him. 
And maybe this translation, as we call it, of a Bible wasn't necessary. If you leave the King James on its own and compare the Book of Mormon to it, the Book of Mormon just shines. If you bring the inspired version into the mix, now you got to start answering questions like Isaiah 29. And it can be fraught with difficulty. So anyhow, my second conclusion is that if you want to read Isaiah, just read it from the Book of Mormon. It's a far better version in a translation. So oh, th this is just some questions I had. So there's a lot of differences in that. And we've, we've talked about it. I think the Book of Mormon has good answers for this. The, the second part I want to talk about is called the Adam Clark Commentary. I guess I could have done this as a separate one, but since our time has been limited, I thought, well, I'll just do this together. Um, there's been some work in the last few years that has shown that of the different ways the inspired version differs from the King James or the authorized version, you know, we've always been told what was done by inspiration. Um, that could be true. And I'm not saying some of it isn't inspired, but what's interesting is things that I always felt like had to be inspired and and now we're finding they may have come from a different source one of them was a guy named adam clark who is adam clark not someone i've really heard about in my day but uh he, he lived in the 1700s died in 1832 he wrote a biblical commentary called the adam clark commentary uh and he was an irish methodist guy he was well known in his day he was a hebrew and greek scholar um his commentary was well regarded he took over 40 years to write it okay and it became available in the 1820s so it was definitely around when joseph smith was there it was a contemporary work so what's interesting is that when you start comparing now the inspired version in the king james to adam clark's writings well here's here's one isaiah 34 7 from the king james uses this word, the unicorns shall come down with them, the bullocks with their bulls, their land shall be soaked with blood and their dust made fat with fatness. So this word unicorns, it, it's different in the inspired version. It says, and the ream shall come down with them and the bullocks and their bulls and the land shall be soaked with blood and their dust made fat with fatness. Well, this word ream is one of the only Hebrew words that got inserted in to Joseph Smith's changes in the Old Testament or the New Testament, actually. <laughs> but where does this word ream come from? It, it, it was used in place of unicorns. This is the Adam Clark commentary. This was Adam Clark's words. This is what he wrote from his commentary that I pulled out. The unicorn shall come down. And then he has this Hebrew word, ream, ream translated as wild goats, all right, by Bishop Loth. So this guy Loth, who I mentioned, he had a commentary, and that's where it came from. But Adam Clark's commentary was the source of this word ream, okay? Um, it, you know, I'm thinking if you were trying to translate from the Hebrew and it was authentic, wouldn't you say ream or, in other words, the Hebrew translation for goat? You, I don't know. But nevertheless, it uses a singular word, which I don't know someone how to – how would they have even known this word? but it inserts it. And the only person talking about that at the time was Adam Clark. Now, I'll let the cat out of the bag. This a gentleman, Thomas Wayment, BYU professor, he and a, a Clark, uh, or what was her name? Uh, Haley, I can't remember her last name. Um, she was a student working for him at BYU. They put together a book and they've got like 200 similarities now between the inspired version and the Clark commentary. More than you could just say are coincidental. And so, a few of these uh, exist here in this PowerPoint, just a few, but but I want to show you. And, and they're, that's where their work is sourced from. You can buy the book or you can find pieces of it online. But um, this is interesting from Colossians 2. We get a phrase which exists in Colossians 2, verse 21, which, you know, if you read the preface, which for time I'm not going to read, but it just says, which are after the doctrines and commandments of men, who teach you to touch not, taste not, handle not, all those things which are to perish with the using. The King James just says, touch not, taste not, handle not, which are to perish with all the using. So King James on the right, inspired version on the left, the red is inserted in the inspired version. But when you read the Adam Clark commentary, he 
it begins with this verse 22, and he makes this statement. He says, after the commandments of men, he says, these words should follow the 20th verse of Colossians 2.22, of which they form a part. So Adam Clark suggests these words after the doctrine of men, and he says, put them in after the 20th verse. And what do we get in the inspired version? Here's the 20th verse, and then we get that very phrase inserted, which are after the doctrine and commandments of men. Now, you could say that Joseph Smith was inspired to do that, but it just seems a little too coincidental that it was contained also in this book, and it was exactly as it was written in that book. Um, I Again, I, I look at this and I'm thinking, okay, that's interesting, but they they found many, many of these, and I don't have the book that Thomas Wayment uh, published, but again, it's got more things like this. I, I just found these online. Um, here's one you'll like, Mike. This was uh, from our recent conversation. I, I just found this one today. Remember how we talked about why did Joseph Smith change Revelation 12 in the inspired version about the woman in the wilderness from a thousand 203 score days as it's written in the King James and he changed it to years. All right. That's mm -hmm. a big difference, but why? Well, guess what? Adam Clark's commentary on revelation 12. This, these are his words, the apocalypse being highly symbolical. It is reasonable to expect that it's periods of time will also be represented symbolically that the prophecy may be homogeneous in all its parts. The Holy spirit when speaking of years symbolically has invariably represented them by days. And then he goes on to say, as an example, Ezekiel had to lie on the side 390 days. He said this represented the house of Israel bearing their iniquity 390 years. Okay. And another example, 40 days on his right side to represent the house of Judah in a symbolic manner, they should bear their iniquity 40 years. So he's showing other places in the Bible where, Days symbolize years. But this is now the end of his phrase. Adam Clark said this. The 1,203 score days, therefore, that the woman is fed in the wilderness must be understood symbolically and consequently denote them as as many natural years. So there it I is. Just, if, if there's a pattern of days being, you know, being years in, the, in those two examples, why not keep the pattern consistent instead of switch it? So now the pattern's gone and you've just substituted what the pattern's supposed to mean. So there's, you lose some consistency there. Yeah. If and in so, fact, that's what it's representing and does it always represent days to years. And I, I would hate to sneak in there and change one instance and, and just substitute out years for what, you know, what else should be substitute out in all of right. these prophetic things. Yeah, exactly. And so, we looked at this and compared it last time to verse 14. I don't have it up right here, but verse 14 in the King James talks about times, a time, times, and a half a time. So three and a half times. If a time was a year, that's three and a half years. Three and a half years is 1,260 days. Okay. So that's how the math works out. So if, if you left it alone, what the King James says is in parallel to the rest of the chapter. If you insert years, because you're reading the Adam Clark commentary, and he says, hey, we're talking years here, not days. Well, where did that come from? It was the Adam Clark commentary. That's where it was suggested. At least that's how I read it. So, you know, I, I don't know that it was done so much by inspiration to change Revelation 12. And this goes back to what we were talking about before, but I, I think it's worth bringing up in context. What we've relied on in the restoration is it's, it's so, somewhat criminal. We've taken this word 1260, which in and of itself has no bearing to something in the latter days that, that we as the church associate. But then we're told, oh, well, there was a theologian who lived sometime afterwards, and he came up with a year 570 when the Gentiles... Christianity died out, so to speak. And everything after that time wasn't anything following the teachings of Jesus. So what we in the Restoration have done, have taken a biblical number and combined it with a theologian's number to come up with a new number, which 570 plus 1260 equal 1830, which bingo, 
from the time of Jesus' birth to 1830 is when the church arrives, and suddenly we think we're fulfilling prophecy. Well, the, where else does God ever do that? He says, well, I'm going to give you a number, and then you have to kind of combine this with a different number, and then, but that's not in Scripture. And then the sum of those two numbers equals something where I'm going to do something really great. I mean, think about it. He never does that. But we've been told for you know a couple hundred years now that that's what happened. That's how come... 1830, April 6, 1830 is a magic day in time because it was prophesied. Well, it's like in the Book of Mormon, for instance, Nephi says the Messiah is going to be born 600 times, 600 years from the time my father leaves Jerusalem. That was the whole number. It wasn't 600 and some number that, you know, someone else added. It, it was the same with Samuel. Five more years come and then we have the sign of his birth. It wasn't like Sam who said, hey, I'm going to give you a number, and there's another guy who's going to come along and going to give you a number. His words aren't written in the Book of Mormon. But if you find those, add my number to his, and you're going to get the answer. No, it, God, God never did that anywhere else. So why are we left to believe that was true for us? I just feel like this whole thing was something where people were overzealous. They were grasping at something, trying to make something fit. And in fact, as we shared last time, I don't think I explained it very well, but my my summary of Revelation 12 is that for whatever it's saying, I don't think it was saying anything prophesying about the Gentile church coming back. There were words added to it later that weren't part of the Adam Clark, Clark commentary either about the kingdom being born and everything. I just think we need to take it all and put it aside and say, okay, what does the Book of Mormon say about all this? Um, it says something totally different. And again, if we start seeing these revelations through our own registration, Gentile paradigm, we might miss the larger meanings. So, um, okay, enough of that. So here's here's one more, and I think this is kind of the last one I want to share on this. We've been trained that the inspired version had, uh, you know, verily uh, an explanation. Lead us not into temptation in the King James is read, suffer us not to be led into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I mean, every eight-year-old in pre-baptismal class learns Matthew 6 this way. It's unique to the inspired version. We've been taught the beauty of this because it's the explanation that God would never lead us into temptation, but we want to appeal to him so that we he would not suffer us to be led. That just seems more consistent with the nature of God that we believe. And I believe that's true. But I also believe that came by inspiration. And, and what I'm finding is this, this word suffer us not to be led. Uh, this not only comes from Adam Clark's commentary, but I'm just going to jump down to the bottom. He, he, he points this out. He says the primitive fathers would have understood it differently. And he talks about, this, and this is a word I love to use. Adam Clark uses this word, Hebrew, Hebrewism. And he says, this phrase, um, lead us not in, is a mere Hebrewism. Adam Clark said this, God is said to do a thing which he only permits or suffers to be done. So here, Adam Clark is teaching that this phrase, lead us not into temptation, was a Hebrewism. But God would only do the things that he would suffer to be done. That word suffer is present, but it gets better. There was another commentary produced in 1811. It would have been popular in the day, but this was on the Catholic Bible. This scholar, George Haydock, was again well-renowned. He says, God is not the tempter of evil or the author of sin. He tempteth no man. We pray that he would not suffer the devil to tempt us above our strength. See, he's commenting on this same passage saying, that we pray, our prayer should be that God would not suffer us to be tempted above that which we can bear. It's right here in the commentary. Wesley, John Wesley, uh, a little earlier in, in the 1700s, produced this. And his commentary says of the same passage, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Oh, that thou helpest our infirmities, suffer us not to enter into temptation. So, Again, these are commentaries that are widely available in Joseph Smith's day. It wasn't a novel thing to come up with this idea, do not suffer us. Uh, here's, here's the last one. Now, this was published in 1832. 
it may or may not have had influence on Joseph Smith, but but it may have because it makes this statement, and I'm just going to jump down to it. This phrase then must be used with a sense of permitting, do not suffer us or permit us to be tempted to sin. That's you know four different commentaries here, all in the 18, 17, 1800s, that all imply this idea was a Hebrewism, and it meant don't permit us to be led to temptation. So when I when I read this back in the Book of Mormon, it's it's beautiful again because as always, the Book of Mormon is a translation into English, but yet it leaves certain Hebrewisms intact. Um, things like soon cometh and speedily cometh, those could be construed that way. But there's other Hebrewisms that we get in, in other texts. But but here the Book of Mormon simply says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Just someone a week ago asked me, why why didn't Joseph Smith change that in the Book of Mormon? That was their question. Why didn't he change it in the Book of Mormon to say, suffer us not to be led? Then it would have matched the Bible. I think the response is, lead us not into temptation, was grammatically correct for the Hebrew. And as it's translated into Hebrew, it's correct. The implication carries a Hebrewism, which we have to understand the nature of Hebrew to assimilate. But it would have been incorrect to state it any other way, because this is how it would have been stated had the Hebrew been correctly translated to English. And they wouldn't, they wouldn't have needed to have commentary on what it really means they, they would have understood it exactly no that's a great point and I, and I hope everyone listening got what mike just said the people in jesus day knew exactly what it meant and it was written the way it was stated it it wasn't it wasn't split out for us to uh, somehow understand it as englishmen and so that's how it was stated in the day and that's how it was recorded so, yeah so a guy named Philip Barlow, he he made a book on changes to the inspired version. And he talks about long insertions like Isaiah 29 would be one, some theological corrections, interpretive additions to clarify, harmonization between the Gospels, grammatical changes, five different classifications of changes in the inspired version. Well, Thomas Waymont from BYU uh, made this comment that, Items three, four, and five appear to be influenced in the Adam Clark commentary. Again, I'm not going through all of them. I just want to show you a few of them. And, and I don't do any of this to, again, try to shake people and their faith. Um, but it does draw into question the word that we've used, translation. You know, never did the Book of Mormon, I'm sorry, never did the inspired version get presented as this was a translation. But I think because of that, book titled Joseph Smith's New Translations, we were led to believe that it was a translation of sorts. I, I don't think it was. I think it was a commentary. And there were good men who were writing commentaries who were probably inspired. I think you can't work on something for 40 years and want to do it as a service to God and not have God touch you at some point in time. I mean, these people were trying their best. You know, Adam Clark was worked for 40 years on his book if he was inspired to write it and Joseph Smith borrowed it without citing the source, would it still be inspired writings? Yeah, probably so if it's truth. But we were, I was given to believe that everything that came from the inspired version was original source, original changes. And that's where I differ now. I, I don't see it as that. I see it as a collection of, of good and better ideas. But the things that were somehow most important to me I don't know. I don't get it. Now, I haven't addressed Enoch. I haven't addressed other issues on priesthood. We'll have to save those for another uh, conversation. But one thing I will say is that Adam Clark was a huge proponent for the plurality of gods. I mean, he basically believed and taught a three persons, three separate image trinity. Uh, the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost were three separate individuals. This is borne out in some of the other writings. And why why things in the Bible were changed because the book of Mormon clearly says all these three are one that God represents himself through the Holy ghost. God represents himself in the flesh as Jesus, but it's all one God. Um, why the inspired version would say something different. That seems to have come from influences from people around Joseph, maybe Joseph himself. But when you, 
compare it back to the Book of Mormon, there's not harmony. My solution is, okay, go back to the Book of Mormon, hold on to it, because I believe that's what was given the Gentiles so we would not stumble. And so, um, anyhow, that's probably a second and separate conversation about just the plurality. And I know, Mike, you've brought this up from even different sources of where some of the writings that are in the inspired version and the plurality of God suggested could have come into play. Uh, you know, I don't know, maybe we need to have that conversation too. Yeah. And that Trinity is that, that word for Trinity, I think is taken on meaning differently at different times. And even among that word, people look at it different. You, you can follow people like the Bible project and uh, their exp explanation of God and it's uh, it's what I would say would be in line with the Book of Mormon. They get it um, just from understanding Hebrew and the words that they really meant. Yes. But it, and, and not I don't I don't even know in the Christian world, even though they have the word Trinity, that they look at separate mind and thought uh, all along the spectrum. I think there's a variety of understandings among them too, at least from what I've read. Yeah, let's let's take that one up sometime. That'd be good to dive into. So. If we look at the Joseph Smith Bible translation versus the Adam Clark, again, I would turn you to Thomas Wayman. You can search him online. Um, and so the, the Gentile writings that we have, I don't know, some of it becomes a little suspicious to me. I don't lose any of my faith at all. I don't throw anything out the window. My, my feeling is I like to hold on to the Book of Mormon tighter. I like to hold on to some of these other things more loosely. I I do not want anyone thinking you have to reject God and the Book of Mormon now. You know, uh, it's it's not what I'm asking. But just again, I come back to this Book of Commandments thing. It's stated he has a gift to translate the book. I've commanded him that he shall pretend to no other gift, for I will grant him no other gift. You know, did translating the Bible, did that fall under something else, a classification outside of the Book of Mormon? Maybe so. I, I just, I don't know. It, it it gives me more questions than answers, but I always feel comfortable when I come back to the answers in the Book of Mormon. Don't lose heart, you know, lean on the Book of Mormon. That's what I say. Um, the reason I was a little hesitant to share this is because I know it can be uncomfortable for some. And the, the Book of Jacob teaches that as bad was removed from the trees, they only removed the bad as the good began to grow. Um you know, maybe in your life, you don't have to worry about removing anything if it's bad. Just hold on to the things, you know, let, let the good things grow for a while. Uh, but I think there's a point, too, when we start letting go of things that could lead us astray. And we want to hold tightly to the things that are going to lead us to Christ. And, and that's what I see the Book of Mormon doing. So I lean on that and I don't lose heart. I don't throw it all away. I don't have any answers to some of these things. I just see these things and I look at them and I realize... We've been given a real treasure in the Book of Mormon, and I've been remiss for not studying it more thoroughly my whole life. I want to now. I, I want it to be the real thing that guides me and teaches me about who the Savior is. Yeah, so this, um, I've done this a few different ways, but I tried to make one overall spreadsheet that would do everything. Wherever, wherever I could find the Book of Mormon I had Isaiah, I tried to lay out Isaiah from the inspired version in the King James and where there are pieces of it missing, like jump down here to Isaiah 29. I know I'm going fast. Here we have like inspired version, okay, uh, and nothing in the King James. The King James is here on the top in the inspired version, and then the Book of Mormon. But these words that are added in here, if they're green, it's because the two texts match. But if they're not, it's because there's some variation. So this, this started getting kind of long. And so what I went is I started going – kind of chapter by chapter, like this is Isaiah 8 with 2 Nephi 9. And if there was a difference, it's highlighted in yellow. If it's, um, I can zoom in here a little bit. You can see that a little better. If they're the same, I would write in the same. So we, we get several things. I didn't cover any of these today, but sometimes it's just a word that's different. Sometimes it's uh, in, in entire meanings that, that can be different. And so, all these different tabs are just sort of the same thing, comparison side by side. And uh, I think what my intent will be with this is when I get my next website, which is the Book of Mormon Project, you, you know the Bible Project, so we borrowed their idea. 
I'm going to publish all this on there. So it'll be a reference if someone wants to research it. Then. So anyhow, good stuff there. Very good. Yeah. Well, thank you, Corey. Anything else? No, I think that's it for now. I know we covered a lot of scripture, but hopefully this can help people, I think, realize what we've got and where we're at. And again, I, I come back and I say, wow, the Book of Mormon is amazing that we have this truth in our hands. We shouldn't leave it on the shelf or set it aside for something else. I think it gives us a story that we can't find anywhere else. Well, very good. Be safe. Enjoy your trip. All righty. Thank you. Get in our country for a bit and we'll see you when you get back. All righty. Just remember, we're always walking each other home. Amen.